remember he said to me, I've lived a long life. And I remember thinking, no, Dad, that's not a long life. But for him, it was. Because for his peers to live into their 50s, that was old age. Hello, I'm Emmy DeGrappa. Each week, we bring you stories asking our guest the question, why? We learn about their passion, why they do what they do, why should we care, and what can we learn? What better place to explore the human landscape than from the state known for its incredible landscapes, Wyoming? And what better organization than Wyoming Humanities? Serving our state for over 45 years, we share stories, ideas, and wisdom about the human experience. This is What's Your Why? Today, we are talking to Dr. Devra Davis. She is an award-winning, internationally renowned scientist and president of Environmental Health Trust. Welcome, Devra. Thank you so much, Emmy. Delighted to be here. You know, it's so interesting because I've been reading a lot about the Environmental Health Trust that focuses on raising awareness on the impacts of cell phone use on public health and all the cutting-edge work and research that you're doing. But first, I want to just ask you, how did you start down this path? Well, I really think it probably started in my childhood when I grew up in what was then one of the most polluted environments in the world, the small steel town of Donora, Pennsylvania, in the Monongahela Valley. And in October of 1948, when I was really a toddler, in one five-day period of time, air pollution sit, sat on that valley and... At the end of five days, 20 people had dropped dead. It was a terrible disaster. In fact, investigators came from England, and they did a study because they projected that if this ever hit London, the same conditions of this inversion of coal smoke and other pollutants, that thousands would die. And only after that actually happened in 1952, long after that, was the study that was done for the British ever found. I grew up in this town, and there were two things people never talked about when I was growing up. One was pollution, and the other was the Holocaust. And both of them were just too terrible to talk about. I subsequently learned much later in life that the reason why my grandmother was in bed all the time, and I adored her, was because she had become sickened by all the air pollution. And there were so many women like her in bed for heart disease that the hairdressers would travel from one home to another to fix their hair with this blue dye on the gray hair um, because the women couldn't get out to go to the beauty parlor. And my grandmother's bedroom was in what had once been the dining room. So to me as a young child, it always smelled of chicken soup and cookies and things like that because my grandmother was too weak to walk upstairs to what had once been her bedroom. And when she was a younger woman, she was ferocious. She was the first woman to drive a Model T and hand crank it, and she would take her five children before there was a turnpike from Donora, Pennsylvania, to the Atlantic City in the summertime. So those are the stories I heard about her, but I always knew her as a sick old lady. And so that has such a profound impact on your life. That later on when you went to go study and at the university, you made that a, a, a life choice. I suppose in retrospect that that's true. I also lost my favorite uncle, everybody has one, at age 50. He left Donora and moved to L.A., where the pollution was also quite severe, and dropped dead on a squash court at age 50. Another really big tragedy in your life. Yeah. And so from there, I mean, how do you make that, you know, connect the dots for me in terms of your work now and how that journey affects your work right now in terms of, you know, getting the word out that cell phone usage is very dangerous. Can be dangerous. The connection is is kind of take, takes a while, took a while for me to make. I started out with this question of whether there could be a pattern out of death 
which is what we do as epidemiologists. Epidemiology comes from two Greek words, epi meaning upon and demos, the people. So we study the patterns upon the people in time and space that are made by disease and death. So my uncle and my grandmother died alone, but in fact, my uncle died during a peak episode of air pollution in LA, as did my grandmother after her 25th heart attack. And her heart attacks were so common that I, as a young child, remember seeing them and will remember what would happen. It was um, hard for me to believe after the last one that she wasn't going to come back because they always brought her back. But she didn't die until her 25th heart attack. How old was she when she died? 60. Oh, wow, she was young. Nowadays, that's very young. That is true. Right. The yes. 60s is the new 50s or something like that. that I've or heard. maybe even the new 40s. Okay. Right. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Now, tell me what your doctorate is in. My doctorate from the University of Chicago was an interdisciplinary degree in science studies. I then went on to do three postdocs, the last one of which was as a senior postdoctoral fellow for the National Cancer Institute in cancer epidemiology at Johns Hopkins University. So my postdoctoral work really was more in the, in the sciences. I did toxicology, molecular carcinogenesis, biochemistry. And to understand the underpinnings of what it is that gives rise to cancer. And at the time I was studying that, my father was dying of multiple myeloma. That is bone cancer. And I learned that bone cancer is much more common in men like my father who worked as a machinist with benzene and cutting oils and also was exposed to radiation when he worked in the army as a machinist and uh, went into the close submarines working with all kinds of things under close conditions. So we don't really know the things that caused my dad to develop multiple myeloma when he was 54. But at that time, I remember he said to me, I've lived a long life. And I remember thinking, no, Dad, that's not a long life. But for him, it was. Because for his peers, for many of his peers, to live into their 50s, that was old age. It's astonishing to realize that, that in two generations, that's what it was. So we've had tremendous progress in many respects. Air pollution and water pollution and workplace pollution in the United States is lower than it has ever been. And that's because... What happened in Donora gave birth to the Clean Air Act, gave birth to a whole bunch of environmental laws, and some of which I got to work on, like the Toxic Substances Control Act, when I worked way back in the Carter administration for the EPA. And we started to implement some of these laws to try to reduce our exposure. So the United States today is still a leader in environmental protection around the world. That's excellent, though. That is excellent news. And so what, in your cancer research that you're doing right now, what is your main focus? Well, I'm looking now at the molecular issues involved. As a basic scientist, I'm collaborating with some other laboratory scientists in Iran and Israel who are asking the question of the interactions at the molecular level of what goes on when we expose animals to cell phone radiation. And in particular, we're taking prenatal exposure with my colleagues also in Turkey at Ando Kuzmayuz University in Samsun, Turkey. We're using prenatal exposure to animals under controlled conditions where they're shielded from any other factors. And we're looking at what happens to the animal's testes and brains. And we've published a series of studies in the peer-reviewed literature which show that animals that are prenatally exposed to cell phone radiation from a normal cell phone signal generated by a computer to simulate what we get from our non-thermal cell phone signals today, that those animals that are offspring develop smaller brains, more brain damage, and more damage to their testes. Now, why that's important is that that animal research that I'm working on now is relevant to the human research that we're doing with other colleagues in epidemiology, where we are looking at patterns, particular male reproductive health, all over the world, 
starting really in the 70s, there's been a decline in the numbers of sperm measured in men around the industrial world. There's been a decline in sperm health. It's a huge problem. There's been a decline in the birth of baby boys relative to baby girls. I published on this in the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is a real issue. And what we're doing now is to try to make the link between that experimental research and the human findings. And one of the links has been made by our colleagues at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Ashok Agarwal, MD, PhD, directs the infertility clinic there. And on the website of the Cleveland Clinic, it says, men who wish to father healthy children should get the phone out of their pocket. And that advice is given by infertility experts around the world today. And the basis for that are experiments that they have done where they take sperm from men and they put one sample into a test tube that is exposed to cell phone radiation and the other into a sample test tube that is not exposed. The cell phone exposed sperm die three times faster with three times more damage to their DNA. Now, of course, sperm won't live in a test tube, but the rate at which they die is three times faster when exposed to cell phone radiation. That is why the infertility experts all advise young men who want to father healthy children to get the phones off their bodies. Interestingly, if you have an iPhone, you go to your phone and you go into your settings. You can find the advice inside the phone that tells you by going to general and then clicking on about and then going all the way down to legal, clicking on legal, you get to the advice in the phone that says to reduce exposure to RF radiation, use a headset or a hands-free device. It also tells you that all phones are tested five millimeters or more off the body. This is really important. I just came back from France two weeks ago. The French government has tested phones and they're not testing them off the body in a holster like we do in the United States, in a holster. They tested the phones on the body and they reported that nine out of 10 of the almost 400 phones they tested failed to meet their test limits by a factor of two to fourfold. So how, how is this information accepted or, you know, maybe um, has, has been given to the American people so that they, they get it? They get it that it's dangerous and, and to take it seriously. Our website, ehtrust.org, has these, the French government data on it. France has made these data available because of the efforts of Dr. Marc Arazi in an organization called PhoneGate Alert. The French government is recalling phones. Dr. Arazi and PhoneGate Alert are calling for the recall of over 200 phones throughout Europe because the Europeans have a shared standard. And in fact, there is a notice now working its way slowly through the European Union process, seeking to make more public the fact of what I've just shared with you. As best I can tell you, there has been no coverage of this issue at all until this moment when I'm talking to you here on this program. Anyone who wants to know about this can find it by going to our website, ehtrust.org. But what the French official I met with, Dr. Oliver Merkel, said to me was, and my French wasn't that good, but he, I was clear enough to understand this. He said, I thought with our results showing this, we had dropped a bomb. I thought the industry was going to react in a huge way. But instead, they've done nothing because nobody knows about it. And as long as people don't know about it, as long as you don't know that that phone in your pocket is exceeding more radiation than the phone has been tested to produce and is allowed to produce, nothing's going to change. And as we all know, myself and my husband included, we are all addicted to these devices. Mm -hmm. We all need to learn how to disconnect and how to reclaim our most personal and private space. 
how to think about dinner and breakfast and morning as times when you really can interact with those we are most close to, and that if you pick up that phone and you look at it, you're bringing a third party in, whether it's the New York Times or some new tweet from the president, and you're disrupting the most private parts of life. And we've become so accustomed to it. It turns out that research has been done by brain imagers. And what they've shown is that functional MRIs confirm that cell phone radiation stimulates dopamine. What? And that's what is addiction. Right? Drugs, right? sex, rock and roll, right? cocaine, sugar, and cell phone radiation. And the younger we start our children on this, the stronger the addiction's going to be. We know from tobacco that those who start to smoke in your young teen years have the fiercest addiction, and it's very difficult for them to really quit. We are now, as a society, addicting our children to technology. And it's, it's the wireless signal that is particularly addictive, and research has shown this again with animals. So the research shows that the signal, the wireless signal, creates dopamine in your brain. Oh, my gosh. And you know what else? What? And this is now, this, what I'm telling you about is more than 20 years old. Professor Henry Lai at the University of Washington did a brilliant piece of research where he trained the animals to get a food reward in response to a very low signal, just like that you can get from a cell phone. And then he injected the animals with naloxone, which is used, it's Narcan, for a heroin overdose because it blocks the opioid receptors. When he exposed those same animals that had been trained to respond to Wi-Fi to get a food reward and first injected them with Narcan, they stopped seeking food. They stopped trying to get the reward because Narcan, the opioid blocking receptor, blocked their response to Wi-Fi. Wow, that's scary when you think about it. It doesn't sound, well, there's so many um, aspects to it, you know, because, you know, we see my granddaughter knows how to call me on my daughter's cell phone. How old is she? She's five. She knows how to call me. And... It's just not even, you know, we just take so much for granted. We don't think, you know, what's wrong with that. I mean, it's technology. We used to freak out about microwaves, remember? And maybe we still should. <laughs> well, the way you can test your microwave oven to see if it's leaking mm -hmm. is you take a phone that's on, put it in the oven, and close the door. And what does that do? <laughs> Wait. You don't turn the oven on. Okay. Do not turn the oven on. Okay. Take another phone and call your phone. If it rings, your oven is leaking. Well, but it's supposed to ring. Not inside a sealed microwave oven. It should oh. not be getting the signal. Oh, okay. Okay. See, that's how little we know about, you know, And you know what? The technology. Let me tell you something. When I started on this, I had three phones. I wore two of them like a gunslinger. I was like managing a, you know, a, a nice, a large staff at the National Academy of Sciences. And we were all really into this and email and everything was just starting and the phones cost a fortune. Remember the early phones, it cost a thousand dollars and you'd have to pay a dollar a minute. And nobody used them except for people who were, you know, doctors and lawyers and military people. They were designed and they were tested with standards that are 20 years old for a big guy with a 12-pound head weighing over 200 pounds. That's the body and the head that's used to set standards for that phone that your five-year-old granddaughter is using. Right. Now, I think it's great for grandchildren to call their grandparents occasionally, but that phone should be on a table. They should understand and their parents should know if you must give a phone to a cranky child in a supermarket or in a car, put it on airplane mode. You can put games on it. Put them on airplane mode. If it's on airplane mode, it is not sending or receiving 
microwave radiation. The reason our phones in this Jackson area are always running out of battery power is because our signals are not strong everywhere. That's not necessarily a bad thing for the animals, by the way, or for us, but we have to get in the habit of going to airplane mode whenever the signal is weak because you see the phone is smart and it's going to look for the tower with a handshake. Where are you? Here I am. Where are you? Here I am. That's the handshake that goes on 900 times a minute. That's, way they're, that's what they're organized to do. If it's next to your body or next to your head, it is sending that signal. Half of it gets into you. So just having it on the table while they talk to you with FaceTime or whatever, that's all right. But you want them, to, of course, to experience the world. And what's going on now is we have increasing reports of children at that age who are addicted to games and these devices, and then they come to school expecting to be entertained. And they don't learn how to do cursive, which is very important for eye-hand coordination, according to experts in neurodevelopment. And they get all wrapped up in these devices. For example, the iPad is tested on a table. It's called a tablet because that's where it belongs. It does not belong on a small body with short hands. It's actually tested 20 centimeters from that big old guy I was talking about with a 200 pound body. Yikes! The same is true for Alexa and all these other devices, right. which all, by the way, open you to security issues. You can get hacked so easily. If you have a smart home, you can be hacked. People can know whether you're home or not. They can, they can figure out all kinds of things about you. So I do not recommend doing this as a general matter. And if you want to have a smart meter, it should be wired, not wireless. Wired connections are 200 times faster and safer for our health and much more secure from hacking. And hacking violates our personal privacy. It's a violation of the Fourth Amendment. We are to be protected from search and seizure in our homes. Once you open up the world to your wireless, whenever you log on, you must be aware that that creates an increase in vulnerability. Which brings up another issue that's just on the rise, and that's fraud and stealing people's identities. And I've already had my, my card um, issue, reissued um, at least twice this year. Twice this year? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Because someone was trying to make a purchase... In Germany, well, I was in Jackson. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But I have a really good company that um, tracks it really closely. I had someone who not only did that, they took out a mortgage in my name. Oh, great. It took me, f took me three years to recover in oh. terms of my credit <gasps> rating. That they is... stole, they really stole oh, enough wow. of my identity because I had been so sloppy because I didn't realize how, how vulnerable we right. are. We are. Now mm -hmm. I have, you know, two-step encryption, which I recommend everybody get, where you have a, when you log into your email, you have a password, and then you have to have a text sent of another number that you have to log in whenever you're trying to log in. And I wow. think it's, it's called two-step verification. Mm -hmm. You can find it online, and you really, it's a way to protect yourself from those things. I also do not recommend doing any serious online banking. No, I you agree. Really don't. Okay. Well, what is your... Because we have to wrap it up, but I just want to know, what is your final, I don't know, words of advice, especially to young people, just because they are the most vulnerable, and, you know, our, our young people just, they are so techno-savvy. They just, you know, I don't it's care, great. Instagram, it's everything. Great. I think all of that, being techno-savvy is the way of the future. We want people to become digital citizens. We want to create netizens. All of that is good. But it's very important to understand that we have not done our homework when it comes to public health. Let me give you an illustration. In the National Academy of Sciences, where I was director of the board on environmental studies and toxicology for almost a decade, we looked carefully at the data on cigarette smoke for non-smokers. And we concluded in the 1980s that this was a serious health risk to non-smokers. You remember, although you don't look old enough to, when there was smoking on airplanes and you would take a long flight and you would come off smelling, you'd stink from smoke. And that's because the so-called non-smoking section did not protect you. By the end of the flight, 
all of that air was mixed. And so we were able at the National Academy of Sciences, it took about three years to do it, to recommend getting smoking off of airplanes. Okay. Where we are now with what we know about cell phones is we have enough information to know that we've got to take precautions. And as many countries are doing, cell phones should not be given to young children. Not. And wireless devices in schools should generally be wired wherever they can be or at least be on a table. We at Environmental Health Trust, we have a guidance to schools and teachers about why and how to go wired, which a number of schools are doing in Israel, in France, in Belgium, in India. But the wireless push is everywhere. 5G, which is coming here soon, will require a tower, 30-foot high tower, every 100 or so meters. I can't imagine that this town, especially those of us who care about wildlife, etc., is going to tolerate something like that. And every 100 meters or so, there will be a thousand so-called small cells boxed in something the size of a small refrigerator that will house these cells that can simultaneously send and receive messages in order that we can stream more video and more games. And the growing thing for the internet now is video and games, and especially virtual reality pornography. I really am not prepared to sacrifice my environment for that. And moreover, Israeli physicists, Yuri Feldman and Paul Ben Ishai, have published peer-reviewed articles for the Defense Agency Research Program that reported in 2008 that this 5G system could cause the skin sweat ducts to resonate like antennas. And they have raised the question recently at a meeting that we organized with the Israel Institute for Advanced Study on whether this would accelerate the growth of melanoma cells in the skin. The Department of Defense is using this technology to create a crowd control weapon that makes your skin feel like it's on fire. All of this information can be found on our website, can be found on, in general with a Google search of active crowd denial. And where we are now is we need a national conversation, despite the difficulty of getting any airtime with the domination of our president and all of the things going on there. We need a national conversation to say, what are the health effects of 5G? What do we know about wireless technology? How can we be smarter about it, just like we did with passive smoke in the 1980s? And unfortunately, what happened with, with tobacco we are projecting a billion deaths in this century from tobacco. How many of them could have been avoided if we'd acted sooner on smoking? So where I am now is I'm working with colleagues who are medical experts in the state of California, Connecticut, Massachusetts, who have agreed to advise their publics after looking at the data on the need to reduce exposures, especially for children, to wireless radiation and to switch us to more wired communications, which again are safer and more secure. This has been an excellent conversation. Thank you for all the information and education that you gave me today. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Emmy. Look Absolutely. forward to talking to you again sometime. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for joining us for this episode of What's Your Why, a production of Think Why, Wyoming Humanities. This has been executive producer Emmy DeGrappa. Please subscribe and never miss a show. For more information, go to thinkwhy.org. 